We now that completes that urgent question. We're now going to come to the next urgent question. Members like to leave? Please do so. Ben Bradshaw. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. To ask the Second Church of States Commissioner if he will make a statement on the outcome of the meeting of Church of England bishops on equal marriage in the Church of England. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And as you know, I offered to make a statement to the House yesterday, but was advised uh, that a response to an urgent question would be preferable. Last Friday, the bishops of the Church of England published a pastoral letter and draft resources that will enable same-sex couples to come to a Church of England church to give thanks for their civil marriage or civil partnership and to have a service in which there would be prayers of dedication, thanksgiving and blessing for the couple. The bishops also apologise for the rejection, exclusion and hostility which LGBTQI plus people have faced in some of our churches. The bishops are united in condemning homophobia and urge churches to welcome same-sex couples unreservedly and joyfully. I am pleased to speak for a church that has the humility to apologise and admit when it has behaved badly. The bishops recognise that for some, and there are many in this chamber today, these proposals do not go far enough, and that for others they will have gone too far. In order to change canon law on the doctrine of holy matrimony, there has to be a two-thirds majority in the House of Bishops, the House of Clergy and the House of Laity of the General Synod, which is itself a devolved body of this Parliament and the vast majority of whose members are elected. Mr Speaker, there is not currently a two-thirds majority in the General Synod to change canon law on the doctrine of holy matrimony. Should the General Synod take a different view at some point in the future, the Synod itself will bring forward legislation to this Parliament in the usual way in the form of church measures. Parliament would not need to initiate legislation to change the Church's practice on marriage. It is also important to remember that this House approved measures in the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Act 2013 to ensure that conscience and freedom of religion were protected for all faiths, including the Church of England. Freedom of religion and belief must apply here in the United Kingdom as well as around the world. We do not want to be in a position where churches are forced to follow the directives of government or parliament on matters of doctrine. The General Synod will consider these proposals next month from the 6th to the 9th of February, after which the bishops will reflect on the views expressed before commending the prayers of love and faith and agreeing to new pastoral guidance. The Church will also engage further in the areas of singleness, friendship, community and household and will offer resources to affirm covenanted companionship or friendship where two people make a commitment to a deep and lasting friendship which could be in a non-sexual relationship. Mr Speaker, I would ask the House to understand that different views on these matters are held with great integrity and that as a church it is welcome that we are in a position where many can say I totally disagree with you and I love you dearly as you are my brother or sister in Christ. That is a model we should try to emulate in our own Parliament. Our proposals will allow clergy and laity to follow their consciences before God in, under, in their understanding of Holy Scripture as to whether to use the prayers provided. Ben Bradshaw. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, for allowing this urgent question, and I'm grateful to the uh, Honourable Member for his uh, reply. Could he perhaps explain to Parliament how continuing to discriminate against lesbian and gay Anglicans in England 
is compatible with the unique duty of the established church to serve everyone. How sustainable is it when gay Anglicans in Scotland and soon in Wales may marry in church, but our constituents in England may not? What consideration was given to his predecessor Sir Tony Baldry's suggestion that those parishes that wish to conduct same-sex weddings should be able to, but no parish be compelled to? And why was this suggestion rejected? How does the Bishop's statement sit with the Church's mission to appeal more to minorities and young people, given most young people, I suggest, find the position of the Church incomprehensible? How meaningful is an apology for historic homophobia and discrimination when that discrimination continues? And can he explain the status of the prayers he referred to for blessing that are being proposed? These will bless the individuals, but not their relationship, as I understand it. Why not? And what will happen to clergy in same-sex relationships? This is not at all clear from the bishop's statement. And what would be the consequences for a gay Anglican priest married in Scotland if they applied for a job in England? And what about the celibacy rule as it affects the clergy? There is nothing about physical expression of love or intimacy in this statement. What consideration has been given to the potential complexities involving the monarch as head of the Church of England when teaching and practice varies across the United Kingdom and church rules in England diverge from the law? And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, what can he say to reassure Parliament that the bishops are not allowing policy to be dictated by a minority of very vocal Anglicans in England and in some overseas provinces while neglecting their primary duty to serve all of God's people in England. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and the Honourable Gentleman, who, with whom I have, for whom I have the greatest respect and with whom I have discussed these issues privately on a number of occasions, I will do my very best to answer his questions. He did pose me quite a number of questions, so I may have to get back to him in writing on some of them. I mean, it, it is the case, Madam Deputy Speaker, that um, there has been a distinction in, 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 in civil law and church law um, about marriage for, for some time, so, so that is nothing new. In terms of the different constituent parts of the United Kingdom, he is correct that in the uh, Episcopal Church in Scotland, um, it is possible for same-sex couples to be married. The Church of England is now moving to the same position as the Church in Wales in offering blessings. And my understanding is that the Church in Ireland uh, does not actually allow either of um, those two um, possibilities. Um, as I said in my um, initial uh, response, Madam Deputy Speaker, um, these matters are up to the Synod of the Church of England, which is a democratically elected body, just like this Parliament. It is, in fact, a devolved body of this Parliament set up by Parliament to take decisions. The vast majority of Synod members are elected, and uh, there are three houses, as the Honourable Gentleman will know, House of Bishops, House of Laity, and the House of Clergy, and it is up for, for members um, in the Synod to uh, decide and, and take action on these matters. The Honourable Gentleman talks about the prayers. I don't know if he's had an opportunity to, to read the prayers for the convenience of the House, Madam Deputy Speaker. I shall put a copy of the prayers and the response from the bishops in the Library of the House. They are very beautiful. Um, I would co uh, commend all uh, Honourable Members here to, to find some time to read them if, if they are um, interested. The, Bishops will reflect on uh, the debate at the General Synod um, between the, the 6th and the 8th of February and then make, make a formal commendation of, of, of the prayers to the Church. Um, the Bishops will also be getting together in a smaller group to bring forward new pastoral guidance which will replace the old issues in human sexuality which is now about 30 years out of date. I understand that that work will happen at pace. Uh, the Honourable Gentleman may know that uh, we don't take away the living from any priest, depending on, on their uh, sexuality or, or, or who they are living with, but that pastoral guidance is going to be revised. There is a new pastoral consultative 
uh, committee um, which uh, has been set up and, and that work will happen at pace and will report shortly um, back, back to the church. Father of the House, Sir Peter Bottomley. Madam Deputy Speaker, I think the whole House should be grateful to the Honourable Member for Exeter for the way he's raised this and we recognise that our Honourable Friend, the Second Church States Commissioner, is a channel of peace rather than a conflict. But can I say to him, as I said to his predecessor over the uh, appointment of women bishops, that this House will not put up with being held up by one third of one part of the General Synod. For those who want to, they can look at the library briefing from 11th of August last year, 2022, to see that the Enabling Act of 1919, which established the General Synod as a way of stopping bills having to go through all the stages forming the House of Commons, can be amended and that some recent legislation wrongly gave permission for flying bishops and people under them to refuse to uh, recognise women ordained in the Church of England. We're coming to a stage on that and on this where the Church of England needs to wake up. And I commend to them, establishing a commission that's similar to the Chadwick Commission in the past, saying how do they get themselves out of the dilemma and do they want to help solve it or will they leave it to us to do it for them? I have great respect, uh, of course, for, for what the Father of the House uh, says, and I know that many members in this House take a close interest in what happens in the General Synod of the Church of England, but it is equally the other way. And uh, what I will do today, and I, I, I commit to him and to all Right Honourable and Honourable Members here, is that I will feed back uh, to the Synod not only what is sent here, but the, the strength of feeling uh, on these issues. That is my role as, as a Second Church of States Commissioner and I commit to everyone here to, to feed back uh, fully and frankly uh, the views of this House to, to the General Synod. Jim Shannon. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, I thank the Church Commissioner for his responses so far. Uh, th does the, the Church Commissioner not acknowledge that enshrined in legislation uh, was and is the protection for those who hold biblical beliefs with regards to the definition of marriage, and in particular that there would uh, never be a case where government instructed the church in what to believe and how to express those beliefs unless they contravened the law. With this being an absolute fact, does the church commissioner agree that, that how the Church of England approaches marriage and blessings is a matter entirely for them and not for the legislators in this place. Uh, well, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, as I said in my uh, opening statement, there are a range of views within the church, and we have seen just now there are clearly a, a range of views within this house. The honourable gentleman carries out in a very distinguished manner his role as the chair of the all-party parliamentary group on freedom of religion and belief, and he does that on behalf of uh, Christians all around the world. And I think part of the sense of his question is that we allow that same uh, freedom of conscience <laughs> to individual priests within the Church of England. There will be very many who rejoice at uh, what the Church did last week and who will be providing these prayers. But there will be some, and I think the Honourable Gentleman was speaking for them, um, who will uh, not feel able in terms of their conscience and their understanding of uh, Holy Scripture to, to, to go forward. And also, I think it is worth just briefly reflecting, Madam Deputy Speaker, on, on the point the Honourable Gentleman made about the, the, the relationship between Parliament and the Church. And if we look back at our history and perhaps the founding of the United States of America, um, we, we will see that uh, on uh, times when Parliament has got over-involved in the life of the Church, that has led to um, some Christians feeling quite, quite strongly about that. But as I say, I'm the servant of this House and I will reflect what has been said back to the Synod. Uh, Chris Loder. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I thank my right honourable friend for his uh, response to uh, the Member for Exeter's question? I think it's right that there is a fine balance between equal marriage and freedom of religion in this debate, and it's right that we have it, and I'm pleased that, that those points are being made. But I hope you'd agree with me that five years for the House of Bishops to come to a, 
it's not even a conclusion at this stage, it's far too long, and maybe the synodical arrangements which we have are not fit for purpose, and we should look to reform them. But could I just um, briefly say to my honourable friend, my real concern here is for those who are directly affected here and now. Those are members of the clergy today who are either not allowed to get married for fear of losing their job or having to lie about it, or those who want to be a priest who are not permitted because they are already married. Could my honourable friend tell me what exactly um, he, he will be able to uh, confer, uh, return to the, um, the House of Bishops in this matter and what advice he may be able to share with us in terms of their conversation? Speaker, I'm grateful to my honourable friend and I, I believe that I can uh, reassure him, Madam Deputy Speaker, in the, as I said earlier, the, the new pastoral guidance uh, will take account of the major change which the Church of England took last week. That guidance will be uh, put together at pace by a group of bishops and by a wider group with, with a, a diverse uh, range of lived experience on these issues. And the changes which the, my honourable friend uh, seeks um, I think I, I'm able to say to him that, that he and others who are concerned about this will be uh, pleased about the direction which this new pastoral guidance uh, is going to go in. Sir Chris Bryan. Speaker, there's an awful lot of pain. Imagine being a church warden. You turn up every day of the week, maybe, to open the church before the priest gets there to do the 8 o'clock. On Sundays, you turn up a couple of hours beforehand to make sure that the church is warm. You clean the vestments, you iron them, you make sure that the church is prepared, and you make sure there are enough, there's enough. You, do the, you count the collection at the end of the service, and you've fallen in love with somebody from your own sex. And the place that you devoted your life to, and your God, is that church, and that's the place where you can't get married. That's terribly, terribly painful. And I think there's still a cruelty in what the bishops have brought forward. There's a sort of hypocrisy. I know they're trying to square everything off, but in the end, there's a hypocrisy that will bless the individuals, but not the relationship. You can have a sort of blessing of your relationship, a celebration, but you can't be married. You can't refer to the other person as your husband. And imagine being a priest and your church warden. You want to be able to marry your church warden to the person that they love. And is there any biblical teaching that says that this is wrong? Any? Really? Did Jesus say a single word about same-sex relationships or marriage? I don't think he did. He said a great deal about love, a God of love. And St. Paul said that in Christ there was neither male nor female, neither Jew nor Greek. And I think you would probably also say it, <coughs> neither gay nor straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And the whole House will have been deeply moved by uh, what the uh, right honourable gentleman has uh, said. And uh, I get his, his passion and, and his strength of feeling on, on this issue. And I don't know if the uh, right honourable gentleman had a chance to see the press conference uh, from the Church of England last Friday. The Archbishop of York was... Uh, deeply moved uh, about what the Church of England did last week, as in fact was the, the Archbishop of, of Canterbury, who mentioned a f former member of his congregation who, uh, who, who was gay, who, who, who later took his own life, and what a terrible tragedy that, that was uh, for the Archbishop of Canterbury and for, for many, many others. Uh, in a sense, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, the Church of England, um, if it will forgive me for saying this, has almost managed to upset absolutely everyone because these proposals clearly do not go far enough for some. And actually, I would just ask the House to understand there are some who are deeply grieving and troubled because they believe they've gone too far. And the Honourable Gentleman is right, we, we read the same Bible. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's slightly strange. I don't even have a degree in theology, and here I am, the only person in the whole Parliament who speaks for, for the Church of England. 
But I study the, the Bible like the Honourable Gentleman, and I know that, that good and true people can come to, to different conclusions about it. He will know that, and he will respect that. And um, I, I thank him for his gracious and very moving words just now. Sir Desmond Sway. Having been the government whip on the Equal Marriage Bill, I can say that this is a typical Church of England fudge. But all the more welcome for that, because there are other fish that have to be fried. Aren't there? Well, I don't, I don't take away for one moment the seriousness with which honourable members on all sides of the House view this issue, and, and I see the numbers who've come in for this statement today. So it, it is a, a, a deep and a serious issue, and I, I absolutely get that. Uh, and my friend is also right that the, the mission of the Church of England is, is to save souls, and we need to get on and do that as well. Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, can I first of all say that I have grown up with a deep respect for the Church? But I have to say I think the right honourable member for the Ronda spoke for a great many of us when he said that we cannot understand how a church, a faith so rooted in the belief in love and goodness, can still accept that it can make some of its own parishioners, its own clergy, feel that they are somehow less worthy. And I'm afraid I'm one of those people who is less than happy with this and feel that it sends the wrong message to an awful lot of people in this country about what the church actually stands for and risks separating the church from a great many people who might otherwise be part of it. Does he not agree? Well, I, I hear what, what the Honourable um, Lady says and, and I would just repeat... Um, the apology made by the bishops, the fact that the bishops welcome same-sex couples unreservedly and joyfully. And perhaps you'll allow me, Madam Deputy Speaker, just, just to quote very briefly from something the Archbishop of, of, of York said. And he said that you know, the church expresses its deep sorrow and grief at the way in which LGBTQI plus people and, and those they love have been treated by the church, which most of all ought to recognise everyone as precious and created in the image of God. We are deeply sorry and ashamed and want to take this opportunity to begin again in the spirit of repentance which our faith teaches us. Now, I know that doesn't go far enough, but I would ask the Honourable Lady to recognise the spirit in which that statement was made and the fact that yesterday was a big change, albeit not far enough for some which the church made last week. Maria Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, can I commend the exemplary way in which the Second Church of State yeah, yeah, yeah. is responding uh, today, uh, and indeed the, the dedicated way in which he fulfils his role more widely? Uh, can I also thank him for reassuring uh, members that he will convey the, the varying views of, of colleagues here on this issue um, uh, and, and I know that he does know my view on this um, issue um, but again more widely can I, can I just uh, say to him that there are many here and outside this house who have invested a great deal in promoting freedom of religion or belief across the world and challenging abuses of it and we cannot do that in all conscience in other countries if we do not also honour freedom of religion or belief at home. Does he agree? Well, I, I'm grateful to, to my honourable friend and I thank her for her kind words about me and can I actually warmly reciprocate uh, to her what she does in, in, in her incredibly important role as the Prime Minister's uh, envoy for freedom of religion and belief around the world and uh, she's right that freedom of conscience is universal. I get the, um, the, the issue when that rubs up against the uh, centrality of the issue we are discussing today for so many people. 
there is and will always be a, a tension, but I think her words are wise and should be listened to by the House. Cat Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I um, hadn't planned to speak in this urgent question. Um, however, other contributions have spurred me to note. Now, I often don't participate in church commissioner type questions because I'm a member of the Methodist Church. Now, we've arrived at a slightly different conclusion, but it does strike me that because we have an established church in this country, it, it falls upon all of us to take an interest in and to speak out on the issues of the church. Now, as a Christian, I know that um, God sent his only son to die on the cross for my sins and for all of our sins. And that love is huge and is incomprehensible. Love is such a beautiful thing and should be celebrated. And um, would the second church commissioner uh, convey um, feelings that, that I would represent, which is that, that love should be celebrated in all its forms and that our diversity in terms of human sexuality is not an accident. It's not designed for by God. It's something which is designed by God and therefore is beautiful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I mean, the, the Church of England recognises that the huge privilege it has in being the established church, and it does see its role to speak for all Christian denominations and, in a sense, to hold the ring for all faiths within this country, as the Queen said very movingly at Lambeth Palace in, in 2012. So what she says from the point of view of the Methodist Church is, is an important contribution, and, and I absolutely hear that. And if she has a moment, I would commend... Her, the, to her the, the prayers of love and faith, as so I'm going to be putting a copy in, in the Library of the House. They are beautifully written and they do celebrate love and I think she will find much to commend in them, but I have listened carefully to what she said and I thank her for it. Robin Miller. Thank you, Speaker, I thank my honourable friend for his statement. Um, and I noted in it he spoke of both the vote of Synod but also the strength of feeling. I think that's evident in the contributions. But I can't help wondering, does he agree with me that in actual fact it's premature that we're having this conversation today, while in fact the whole of Synod has not yet had a chance to express its own view on this? Well, I, I thank my, my honourable friend for, for that point. I mean, I think the general Synod of the Church of England is, is deeply respectful uh, of Parliament, as it quite rightly should be. But I would also ask uh, my honourable friends and right honourable members um, across the House to, um, to give the General Synod of the Church of England time. It will have its own debate uh, between the 6th and the 8th of February, early next month. That will be an impassioned debate, and I can assure members here that many of the views which have been expressed here today will be expressed with equal passion in an equally robust way uh, at the General Synod. Um, and I will make sure that Synod is very well aware of the views of Parliament. West Street. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Nothing made it harder for me to come out as a, as a gay Anglican than the Church's teaching on sexual orientation and human sexuality. And in the end, I made the choice that I think many young gay Anglicans did of choosing to be myself and choosing not to go to church. And that is such a tragedy for so many, particularly young Anglicans, across our country. And I fear that the prayers that have, have, have been proposed by the bishops, however beautiful, do not go far enough to bridging that divide and closing that distance between Christians and their God. Uh, so I, I urge them to think again. Uh, and can I just ask him two things? The first is, as an established church, in fact, it applies to all places of worship. I would never cast my vote in a way that compels any place of worship to perform same-sex marriage because I believe in freedom of religious belief. But given this is an established church, surely permissive legislation yeah. that enables places of worship to en enable churches and priests to make that choice for themselves would be a different matter. And certainly I know where my vote would go on that. And finally, seeing as the prayers are so beautiful... Um, will they be said in the chapel of St Mary Undercroft, uh, in St Margaret's Church, or, and in Westminster Abbey? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I, I thank the, the Honourable Gentleman very much, and I'm, I'm deeply saddened by the fact that he felt he was no longer able to, to go along to his Church of England church. And I know what happened last week hasn't gone far enough, but I just repeat that the church now welcomes same-sex couples unreservedly and joyfully. 
On his very last point, and I've spoken to uh, the Speaker's chaplain about this, the Speaker's chaplain, uh, subject to the usual booking arrangements, uh, is happy to, uh, to, to uh, say the uh, prayers of dedication, thanksgiving and blessing uh, for members of this House uh, in the chapel, uh, the, the crypt chapel of St Mary's here within the palace. Within St Margaret's, that is a matter for the Dean of Westminster, and I cannot speak on his behalf, but I'm sure he will make his views um, known. Uh, I, I, I hear what the, uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman says about a uh, permissive uh, um, way of going forward uh, on this, uh, and again, I, I commit to feed that through to the bishops and the synod, and I thank him for making that point. Peter Gibson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank my honourable friend for his reply to the urgent question. And whilst I welcome the movement towards blessings for same co sex couples to take place, is it not time that the Church of England celebrated every relationship and ended this two tier system which labels gay people as second class citizens? I, I think what I would say to my honourable friend. And again, I would um, thoroughly commend to him the, the prayers of love and faith which were written last week, is that last week did mark a major change for, for, for the Church of England. And um, the Church has apologised for the way that it has behaved uh, in the, the past in, in, in making uh, uh, people of the same-sex orientation uh, not feel welcome within church and you know says that it welcomes them unreservedly and joyfully